at the very, very beginning of the 80s, I was just a normal lad that used to go out Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe once through the week. It was hard. Life was hard. There wasn't a lot of money about. So they just wanted to get on, go to work, come home, have the pay, go on a holiday once a year maybe. I didn't have a lot of social life because uh, I worked at weekends. Married at 18, had two kids by the time I was 20. Uh, I was also working shift work on buses. After working at the pit for about 10 hours a day, yes, he usually went uh, and had a, uh, a game of darts occasionally. Big drinkers and like to gamble on the horses and the likes of that. Pigeon men, allotment men, and they used to have the whippet racing and things like that. I was a break dancer, believe it or not. That's what I love to do, I can see you laughing. But I seriously was a break dancer. My uh, name was Cobra and uh, we used to go around town with a roll of lino and a ghetto blaster. CB radio was one of the main things in the 80s. And you used probably think, eh, what? And we used to radio each other, but you had to speak in a CB radio language. Breaker, breakers, anyone in there? <laughs> Everybody looked forward to the weekends, get out and have a good old drink and a bit dancing. The vast majority of the drinking establishments in Ashton, barring three uh, pubs, were uh, social clubs. All the pubs were absolutely packed and it was just a great place to be on a Saturday night, was Anik. Everything was bouncing, music, entertainment. Drink in town in the big market, go clubbing because it was student night on a Thursday. Anik Working Men's Club, where they used to have local bands and singers, but we used to look forward to the bingo and then dress up in really wide trousers and sparkly tops and perms. I used to wear orange paisley shirts. I did like 80s fashion because I liked Big shoulder. I've got very narrow shoulders, so the shoulder pads suited me. But they used to come in with the leather trousers, and they used to have like the, the, the bib and brace. You know, just on a night out, an anic and a bib and brace or leather trousers. No. Puffy dresses come in, and heels, and shoulder pads, and big perms. In the early 80s, because of Princess Diana, everyone had their hair cut short. The lads began to wear really smart trousers and shirts and started to even wear makeup and things. One day I would dye my hair and I thought, well, I had a bit of purple in and a bit of pink in and a bit of blue in and I thought I looked really good. And my dad goes, he sort of looked at us like, I went, are you really going out like that? I went, yeah. He says, you look like a parrot. So I went, oh, well, get in. <laughs> I was a bit of a punk fan from the hangover from the 70s. My partner... Now she was a goth at the time. But there was some good music, but there was a lot of variety. You had everything from heavy metal to goth music to uh, synthesised pop to just total dross. What kind of house did you live in? A street called Rosalind Street, which is right in the middle of the colliery sector. If, if you know Ashing at all, it's uh, made up with the central core of colliery rows that are about three quarters of a mile long. With good neighbours, uh, there wasn't much trouble, it was a quiet area. The rents were quite decent, the houses you got were normally in good repair and the council looked after them. Everybody uh, knitted together, I found the community spirit was just great. Luckily we both had jobs so we bought the house for 16500 in 1982. Whether you like Margaret Thatcher or not it was good because a lot of people bought the houses instead of paying the rent and a lot of people done well out of it so you might have called her but she did a, a good thing for the rent to buy, yeah. It was so, so wrong, so wrong that those houses were our houses. They belonged to every one of us. The Tory ideology is against the welfare state and so the idea is that um, what we do is we can sell off the council houses, we'll, we'll get rid of the housing stock, therefore we don't have to maintain it, so therefore it's another chunk of welfare state that's been removed, and I, and I think that's really wrong, and I think we're really paying the price for it now. It leaves less and less houses for people who genuinely need to be housed in social housing. I think people should have the right to buy their house, but I think a lot of people used it as an excuse to make money. But she wasn't letting the council spend the money that they got from selling the houses to build more houses. And guess what? You haven't got enough houses now. What was your job in the 80s? Well, maybe if I go back three years to the 77 when, when I got the sack for trade union activities. Uh, and in the 80s, I, I was blacklisted. So I, the, the, I, I took a lot of dead-end jobs. I became unemployed as soon as I left the army. Um, there wasn't any work around. Work was scarce. You would sit and watch the news. And there'd be like a ticker tape going across the bottom of the screen. 
of factories that were closing, uh, industries that were closing. I didn't have the impression that there's anything I couldn't be because I was a girl. And women just kind of thought, I can do what you can do. I want to wake my way up and have a, a good career. There was definitely a drive to push girls into science. And also then, um, there was full grants. So I, I knew I'd get a full grant. So I got a full grant to go to university and the fees were free. I started the, the, the working in the mines in 1954. There was loads of characters doing the pit. Loads. Too many to mention. You enjoyed everything. And you looked at your elders and see how them worked. The positive, it's, it's good work. Uh, you've got good mates around about you. And when you go, you do a shift. And you quite enjoy doing that shift. Oh, I, I love my job. I, and I love the lads that were there. Oh, I loved it. I wish I could go back. And that's, I've been finished 20 odd years. You might think it's hard, but it's easy once you get into it. Everybody started on what they call the buttons, just got through on the belts. Then you went on to supplies, which was a step up from the supplies then to your first training. We had to work at the bottom of the shaft and, uh, and about a mile in and then two miles in. And they had their own language. They looked after each other for their very lives. They relied on a, a pit pony for their lives. Anything from 18 inches to two and a half foot. And they were often lying in this, on the side. And there was water running. Well, horrendous conditions, really. Conditions were all right. Just, just exactly what a pit should be like. My dad worked uh, miles out under the North Sea and when he came from the pit his clothes were soaking because it was dripping through and but they were also thick with coal dust so if you stood them for long enough beside the fire they dried like a, a piece of marble. My shift was quarter to four in the morning till 11 o'clock in the morning. The camaraderie though in the uh, mains was very good but the job itself I uh, wouldn't say my worst enemy though no and people used to say oh Pittman are rich and you know, I've got a great life. If I was doing my job and the pitman was doing his, he was going to get a lot more money than me. A hell of a lot more money. Having said that, he was in a lot more danger than I was. And I had holidays that a lot of people didn't have. But I paid for it in that I had my dad suffer for a good bit of his life, not being able to breathe. That was the price of coal. Later on you felt it, but at the time, no, because you were a young daft lad, that, uh, that'll never bother. And the older ones, well, did lift with your head? Because, nah, that'll not bother me. Well, did lift like that? Nah, that'll not bother me. Obviously, later on in life, it come to fruition that it did bother you. Yeah, breathing. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people came out with, uh, they've got their knees. And my first one was a broken, broken rib, broke tibia and fibia. And you knew that in 1951 there was a major pit disaster in Eason Colliery, a disaster in which my dad had changed his shifts and the man who asked him to change was killed. My brothers went, but my dad used to say, now I'll go down the pit, because he came out of the pits because he was involved in a roof fall and the guy next to him got trapped and uh, he lost his life. And my father, he was trapped next to him, they got him out. And after that, my father came out of the coal mine. I think the time I was there, there were was, was three men killed. My granddad had been killed at the pit. Uh, my step-granddad died of pneumoconiosis. Uh, my own dad had emphysema. My friend, when I was just in secondary school, her dad was trapped and then brought out dead from Easington Pit, and I will never forget that day. I've carried a man out dead. Why did I think they were dictated to by a very strong trade union. The strike happened in 84, but we were prepared from 1980. Miners didn't decide to go on strike. They'd lost a series of ballots prior to the miners' strike. But one particular coal mine walked out, which caused a rolling strike uh, where one pit would come out after the other. The union leader come across, lads, we're not going down to work today. We're coming around on strike, they're striking all over the country, it'll not be long, we'll be back shortly, a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks turned into a couple of months, a couple of months turned into, well, eventually a year. There was going to be a lot of mines closed and it was kept secret. And some did fund uh, papers 
the government denied it at that time. Everybody could see the writing was on the wall, there was going to be a fight between the unions, particularly the, the miners' unions and Mrs Thatcher. Mrs Thatcher had come to um, power saying she was going to sort the unions out. Our union was the best union in the, in the country, probably the world. We couldn't, couldn't wish for it being a better union. The trade unions that had grown up in the post-war period had gained a lot of power on the basis of the nationalised industries. Workers had uh, won a lot of rights. Historically they had been strong. They'd opposed the government before. They'd led to the general strike in 1926. What happened in the 80s was quite frankly horrific. and It was almost a form of, of class genocide. It was a way of destroying the unions and the unions that fought, I mean, we have weekends now, we have bank holidays, we have lunch breaks, and we have toilets on site, you know, and this is all thanks to your unions. We didn't have any of this. 12 year olds can't go down coal mines, that's thanks to your unions. I am a believer in unions. The unions were getting too strong. The tail was shaking the dog. You needed them, you'll always need unions. Uh, some union men are in it for themselves, but Northumberland union, they were in it for the men. I was a bus driver at the time and uh, I worked in uh, well, a national company, Western SMT, and uh, I was the shop steward, I was the trade union representative, trying to get better conditions, better working conditions, and uh, I was effective in what I was doing, but they eventually just sacked me and uh, I took it to an industrial tribunal, and the industrial tribunal said, or, or the company says, we'll pay any amount of compensation, we're just not having you back. We'd like to know what you thought of Thatcher. I absolutely hated her. She killed the North East. I would dance on her grave. Just an evil woman. I honestly believe that she was evil. Yeah, you're wasting your time getting involved in politics when you're in the police. Because you're not allowed to voice your opinions, so... And I tried not to have any. But I had a little soft spot for her, really. Now I hate to say I despise someone, but I despised everything that woman stood for. She destroyed, she devastated. Uh, firstly, the miners, her and McGregor. What we have seen in this country is the emergence of an organised revolutionary minority who are prepared to exploit industrial disputes, but whose real aim is the breakdown of law and order and the destruction of democratic parliamentary government. I thought Margaret Thatcher uh, was a very, very strong woman, very strong prime minister. If the Labour leaders at the time were as staunch and as strong in the defence of their class as she was as strong and staunch in defence of her class, then I think society would probably look a, a lot different. Yes, she was the leader of it. She didn't make all the decisions by herself. She had a parliament not done that. So parliament were just as bad as her. And they were willing to destroy whole communities without a plan of what to do next, to rip out the industry, close the coal mines, shipyards. My granddad used to work in the shipyards. And it was about whipping them back into shape and making them the underdogs again and making them tug their forelocks and doff their caps again to the, to the ruling classes. It was a total reversal of, of the previous sort of 40 years, hard work of, of social reform. The destruction she wrought without so much of thinking of the consequences of what that would be for masses of people across the country, not just in mining communities. She might as well have stuck a knife in me when she shut my pit. Thatcher called the miners during the strike the enemy within. She was ahead of the enemy as far as we were concerned. The enemy within, no, no. The real enemy within were the, the ruling politicians. If I had a gun at my hand at the time, <laughs> now would I, I'd be locked up. I mean, I mean, if you think of it, we were t told we were traitors. That upsets me because my brother was a, he was a miner, but he was also a prisoner with the Japanese for four and a half years, and he fought for his country, and, he, and he, he, he stood up for what the country meant, and he put himself through Agnes as a prisoner, and, 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 and she had the audacity to call the, the enemy with him. No, she was the enemy within that woman. And a lot of people still admire her, and I say, what's to admire about a woman that closed shipyards? Not because they weren't making money, because it was political. I think if Margaret Thatcher had been a, a man, she would have had total respect. And I think it's because she was a woman that she got disrespect. She was a pure bastard. She wasn't a woman. 
Arthur Scargill thought he was God. The press definitely made an enemy of Arthur Scargill. Scargill had a hidden agenda, and the, and the hidden agenda was to, to uh, take down a Conservative government. He wanted the Labour government. The union took it upon themselves to pull everybody out. He didn't have a ballot. He didn't get the support he needed. If he had a ballot, he would have got the support. When Scargill had already taken a uh, pit head ballot and, and, and got the mandate for the folk. The unions had too much power. Yes, I, they did. The workers didn't because the workers did what the union wanted them to rather than what, how it should be the union do what the workers wanted. I mean, Arthur Scargill, as I say, he was like, he was well off, you know, his own house, you know, getting paid still. We had didn't have a penny. Who had links with Moscow, whether he did or not, it doesn't matter. The fact is, the papers said he did. They definitely tried to paint him as some form of communist. They're getting money from mining unions in communist countries. It doesn't do the public opinion of how the strike's going a lot of good. He was right. Everything he said was right. Thatcher was out to shut all the pits. What he was saying at the time was like, this is the start of it. This is the dismantling of working class um, industries and the dismantling of unions. It was entirely true. And we formed our own, what was called the North Tyneside Miners Support Group. We had weekly meetings and we organised fundraising for miners and their families. I said to the men, to the, the rest of the committee, I think we need to be organising women because if we don't organise the women, the strike won't last. We agreed that we would send a letter to every woman in uh, East Durham and sort of try and set up some sort of group to support each other. The only good things that I can remember about the miners' strike was the how people came together and the miners that were on strike, the, the people took food parcels and that. I think the majority of the community was with them. People would support you or they would say, well, I don't know if I agree with it, but I don't like what's happening to the families. Or it was, it's all self-inflicted, you know, you should get yourself back to work. We spent the whole time just collecting money on the street, uh, just so that we could feed uh, the, the, the families. Me and Denise Gregory went to the miners' meeting, but we couldn't go in the meeting because there'd be, never been any women in the meeting. Billy Strobbs, the, the uh, union chair, he came out and he said, you can come in now. I lifted my foot right up and I said, are you sure? Because once this foot comes over that threshold, it's not going back, mind. The strike created Immense hardship amongst people. On a daily basis on the picket, picket lines, on going out collecting food, collecting money uh, for the strike phone. Some of the mortgage companies, the co-op for instance, uh, suspended the mortgages um, of some of the miners so that they wouldn't run into arrears. The co-op distribution centre and uh, someone we knew worked there and they used to send us supplies. Um, and it was allegedly damaged goods, but I'm sure some of it was quite deliberately damaged to send to us. And I knew, I knew one milkman, he, he, all through the strike, he left a family two pints of milk a day, and he got the money back, but how brave him to do that. And the butchers, the people that was our customers, when they were gone into the shop, they maybe be going for a few links of sausage or some mince, what they could afford. And they were, up, they were putting extra stuff into the parcels. Miners have a strong tradition of unity. It's born out of the type of work that they do underground. The solidarity between people. The tradition was that you, you wouldn't cross a picket line. That was, that was seen as, as um, uh, unacceptable. It was a tradition in the Labour movement. You don't cross a picket line. You don't betray your fellow workers. My mother went Myrtle when the first scab went in at Easton. My mother, she says, I couldn't shout scab. Everybody was shouting scab. She says, I just said, how are you, body lad? Don't go in. She says, and he didn't go in. He turned back. So it must have been because I said that. Either. And Alec was absolutely teeming with miners trying to stop the uh, people who were blacklegging, as they call it, going to break the strike. I mean, I've never seen anything like it outside the Blue Bell. It's a load of policemen. I mean, hundreds. When the scabs, as they were called, was the ones who wanted to go back to work, were taken in by a coach. The coaches were armoured with mesh across the, the windows. And we had to form lines 
between ourselves and the coaches and the, uh, the pickets who were throwing bricks. And when the coaches came in, the pickets would push, hoping that they could push us under the buses. So that was quite scary. I just thought I was just a hard man and uh, I had to get on that bus the first day. The bricks went through the window. The glass was just shattering on uh, everything. But we got the bus in because the, there was millions of police there. Battle buses, were, when they were on, it was a, like an SES operation getting me in. Yes, the first few days, lots and lots of pickets because the first time it happened, Elton, and that just whittled away because it was bigger fish to fry in Nottingham in Yorkshire. The police behaved in a brutal fashion. Some of the miners got stuck in as well, but there was some of them were quite violent confrontations. We got stopped. There was a roadblock. Where are you going? I says, oh, I'm going to my mum's. I'm taking the bands down. What for? I says, well, she looks after them and she takes them to school. How long will you be? I says, about a quarter of an hour. Oh, OK, you can go through. And the little one shouts, but ma'am, you didn't tell that policeman we were going to the picket line first, did you? And I thought, I could have just killed him. And then other places, like at Brinkley, an open cast site, you were standing talking to them until the buses turned up with the, the so-called scabs in. And then they would start spitting and cursing and swearing at you and trying to assault you. And then when the buses got in, it was back to normal. They would start talking to you again, sharing cups of coffee, and because we used to provide all the coffee for them, because we got it for nothing, and they had no. The Tory government's preparations also involved deploying soldiers in police uniforms on picket lines, and they wanted just police. They, they, they were brought in. They were soldiers, uh, so they were they were soldiers that were dressed up in uh, police uniforms, and they they they, they just attacked. Uh, the miners that were on the picket line uh, and we had our oh, grave, we had the different pits uh, uh, and miners were killed uh, so they were just defending their right to work. By the time it got well into approaching a year on strike it was very very difficult for some families and when you've got pressure inside your family, your children are suffering and you can see why people return to work, but it was the wrong decision because they were letting down the people who stayed out. And they were banging on their shields to intimidate the, the people. But then when they the, the taste the miners forward and they opened their ranks, them horses supposed to be trained to move away crowds sideways, pushing, shoving, and they are doing like a cavalry charge in. And they were running over the top of people. And as soon as they were down, the police was in, beating them with their truncheons and you could tell by the look of them they were relishing it, a lot of them. With policemen standing, banging their, their, their shields just to get the adrenaline, to, to, to feel they were going into a war. Just like walk down the street and then <laughs> the bus co came along, take the workers in and then the police just started beating on their shields and just, I was at the front and they just says, run you bastards. So I thought, I just turned around and run because they were running at us. And they put this man recovering from major stomach surgery into the police van. This little woman is shouting, I want me man. Why are you locking him up? He hasn't done anything. So they put her in the van and all. They come out with and I, and I meant to hurt her. Meant. My granddad was upon us and I was always brought up to respect the law. Always. But I couldn't respect that. The missiles would bounce off the buses and hit us from behind. So there was a few minor injuries that way. But there was, I never seen any serious injuries at all. But it was terrifying. Like. A little bit niggle between the police and them because they were, they were making a lot of money them times. And they were telling the miners what they spent their money on going on holidays. They were getting a, a lot of uh, overtime, the policemen, and they were showing their cheques. It's, you seen it on the television, they're showing their checks to the mayor and said, carry on lads, keep it up, look at this, I'm getting another call. I was arrested on the picket line and I think it was around about the January of 1985. Um, again, it was, it was in protest to try and stop the buses coming in with the miners who decided to return to work. And um, 
we just kind of stood around. The police grabbed us and threw us in the back of van, so we weren't actually being violent or anything. Uh, the Tory government spent millions breaking that strike. Spent absolutely. In fact, there was no stone left unturned. It's a horrendous thing, but we were just pawns in it all. I mean, shortly before uh, the miners' strike, Margaret Thatcher had made sure that we all got big pay rises, which we did. And a lot of people said we were bought, but we weren't. You've only got to comply with the rules, the law, the orders that you're given. And there's no way you can turn around and say no. In the afternoon, there were more injuries and arrests as police drove the pickets back up a hill away from the coking plant. Cars from a nearby scrapyard were overturned and set alight to stop the police advance. When they were there at the football match, they were scraping their money to go and watch the football. I'm getting a bit emotional about this, actually. The away fans would wave their £10 note at the supporters. Because they were poor in the north. It was more about survival towards the end. Things were, were much, much harder. And that was one of the reasons why some of the miners went back after a long time. It was starvation. Sea cool, and that was the only thing I'd done, which I never thought I'd do. Uh, went down to the beach when the tide went out, left little granules of cool that we uh, bagged up for, for heating. Um, Two little kids, obviously the families helped. Uh, the wife's mother and father, obviously my mother. I always remember these guys were walking around with, you know, the basket to get when you go into a supermarket. And they were just going around the shelves and they're chucking all these toys in the in the basket. I went up to this guy, because I'm nosy, and I says, what are you doing? I says, he's up, just fill And he says, we're buying um, Christmas presents for the, the miner strikes kids, because I didn't have a penny. I remember the French and the Russian miners sent solidarity presents to Northumberland and Durham. We got turkeys and chickens from France. If a miner lived in our village, but he worked at another colliery, three mile away, two mile away, whatever, he didn't need to walk to bloody see him two mile away to get a chicken or a turkey for Christmas. He got it off us in Easington. So all the groups agreed we would do that. In comes the union. What are you doing like, Heather? I said, well, this is the way we've decided. No, you can't do it like that. Oh, I said, can we not? Lasses, we're on strike. And me poor mother's sitting, she's going, hey, our weather's called them on strike. We've got all these chickens and turkeys. What are we going to do with them? Union came and said, it's all right, Heather. Do it the way you want. It come towards the end, I think, where you couldn't blame them. My stepfather-in-law, was told if he didn't get back to work, he would lose his pit pension. And he was 60, 62, and he couldn't afford to do that. So that's why he went back. The Thatcher government went on to close down the mining industry pit by pit, and we are left with the situation uh, we have today, where there are no more coal mines left in the northeast of England. Had the miners uh, just held the, 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 their firm at that time, I think that they would have defeated, they would have defeated Thatcher. But to some extent, if you look at what happened here, it happened all over Europe afterwards. Those big industries, we don't have them in Northern Europe anymore. And there's still family split and still not talk to each other because one of them also went to work. It depends why they went back, right? Um, most most of them were forced back. I lost a lot of friends who had been friends for years. Some of them, it took a long time for them to get back together again. And the children uh, suffered because of that. But I had a lot of friends on the side I've just talked about, Brinkley there, and uh, they spat on me and never spoke to me again. And then when the collieries eventually closed shortly after the end of the strike, which the the miners had always predicted and the government went ahead. It led to a lot of unemployment. The community was never just the same, you know. A lot of people moved away. I think there's been massive um, repercussions of the miners' strike. I think it still scars people to this day. I don't think Britain as a whole has actually recovered from that. It tore the soul out of a community. I understand that, 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 that we have to have progress and, and things move on. And, and you know, mining was a dirty, horrible, dangerous job but whole communities were built around those pits and to just destroy it just take it away without any plan 
a little bit like Brexit, without any plan for what you're going to do next, I think was disgusting. I'm not sure if it was worth propping up. I don't think, I think so, you know, um, I'm an environmentalist and, you know, I can't support coal. <laughs> for all that, there's jobs. I can't, it, it, you know, it's not worth uh, the air pollution and uh, climate change. Look at the coal mines. They're out of fashion, aren't they? They're not using coal anymore. They were on a hiding to nothing anyway. And, and I've said that my father was a miner. Support the miners in that way. If Arthur Scargill had given the men a vote, the men wouldn't go back. If it was still going now, I'd be on the picket line now. The unions suddenly became that big, the workers did what the unions wanted. And that's what destroyed the unions. They found Thatcher was unmovable because she wanted to destroy us. You know, they made it quite clear they wanted to end what they saw as the might of trade unions. She was hell-bent on uh, closing the pits, and she did. It wasn't all a loss. People learnt lessons. The biggest lesson now, though, is to resist those that continue to want to divide, turning one against the other, whether it's turning minor against minor, worker against worker, worker against immigrants. We didn't win in that we didn't keep the pits open but we won the moral victory in that we stood for a year and fought. If we hadn't fought and she'd shut them, I would have thought, God, we've lost, we were so stupid. We should have stood. But we fought, we stood, and to me, we still stand tall. I've spent my lifetime mining that black diamond Just like my forefathers and the Generations of lies bound together into the blackness There's no good courage Against that blessed gleam and see Don't cry for me now They say that it's over Don't cry for me now My bunny honey Cry for the lads who spent a lifetime Down in the black Underground, deep out the sea. And I've spent my lifetime mining that black diamond. He said, My brothers, with hearts mightier than steel, faces black like the ghoul of hell at the forest with gleaming eyes shining teeth don't cry for me now they say that it's over don't cry for me now my bunny honey Shed a tear for the blood who spent a lifetime down in the blackness. Miles underground and deep out the sea.